We've been going through the fruit chapter. We've been in John chapter 15. You want to turn there? Uh, once again, this will probably conclude my series on uh, the vine. Okay. I'm calling it much fruit tonight because here's what he says. He says in the eighth verse, herein, is my father glorified that she bear not fruit, not some fruit, but much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. By now, if you've been with us, you have discovered, you found out what it means to abide. You know how often, I think I said recently, that in just verses 7 to 10, the word abide or some form of it uh, appears like 10 times. Or seven times, I, I forgot. You know what it means to abide. And you know how to do it because we talked about that. Tonight, in conclusion, I'd like to share with you some of the much fruit that Jesus says he will produce in your life because you are his branch. Remember, the only purpose for a branch on a grapevine is to bear grapes, is to produce fruit. But we don't produce that fruit. A, a, a grape branch doesn't produce that fruit on its own. What produces the, the grapes on a grape branch is the sap that flows from the vine up the trunk you might say, of the tree, to the branches of that grapevine. That branch has to have that life-giving sap in order to bear fruit, just as we have to have the life of Jesus, who is the true vine, flowing into our lives and through our lives to bear any fruit, let alone much fruit which is what glorifies the Father, much fruit. Well, what is that fruit? Well, we talked about it at the beginning. What is this spiritual fruit? I think we even see several examples of it in this chapter that I want to conclude with tonight. And uh, in the seventh and the eighth verse, let me go back to verse seven. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Drop down to verse 16. The second half of verse 16 says this. Whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. But he also says in that 16th verse that you should, uh, that God's chosen and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. I want to pray. I want to share with you what I've categorized in four categories of spiritual fruit that equals this much fruit. Heavenly Father, tonight as we gather together, as brief as can be done, I pray that you'd enable me to share with folk tonight what this much fruit really amounts to. I pray that you'll give us spiritual insight and understanding. Anoint us with the Spirit of God to be our teacher tonight. And I pray that there would be that blessed promised power of Pentecost that would undertake for me and for each one of us. Lord, we need to hear from you. We want to understand this we want to rejoice in this because this is glorious truth. And so may it, we not miss it. May it not go over our heads. May it not escape our heart. Might it hit the target that you intended to hit tonight. And all to the glory of the true vine himself and the father who is the vine keeper, we pray in Jesus name. Amen. You know what I see in these verses? where he talks about how that whatever you ask, it'll be done. Or as he says in verse 16, whatever you ask in my name, I'll give it to you. 
I can sum that up in one word. And I think this is part of the much fruit. You know what it is? Fulfillment. Fulfillment. Answered prayer that fulfills God's will brings great glory to God and it brings a sense of personal fulfillment to your soul. So part of the much fruit that God wants us to bear, spiritual fruit, is what I would call fulfillment. And notice in verse 16 that that fulfillment is lasting. He said that you would bring forth fruit and that your fruit would remain, that your fruit would be lasting. You know, God made us in his image. And as God's imagers, you're made in such a way that part of human, uh, of human life only finds real lasting fulfillment in a right, rightly related connection with God. You know, people try to find fulfillment in life by many cheap substitutes, thrills, and it might give them a, an immediate high but nothing lasts, nothing gives real lasting fulfillment. But God promises in that 16th verse, lasting fruitfulness that will totally fulfill you. And it all comes down, this lasting fruitfulness comes down to asking. That's what prayer is. You know, prayer, prayer in the broadest sense is a communication and a relationship with God. But prayer in, the, in a narrow sense is asking God, asking God for things. And that's what he says in verse 7. He says, if you abide in me, my words abide, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done. He says in verse 16 again, whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he'll give it you. And so... When you're abiding, what happens is your heart, my heart, becomes entwined with God's heart so that you want what God wants. You want what God wants. And nothing is more fulfilling than, no, that, than knowing that, you, that you're pleasing God. Nothing is more fulfilling than when you pray and when you ask God, you are asking to advance his will and his agenda through what I would call kingdom praying, where Jesus said, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. This is the prayer. This is the asking that is really fruitful. This is the much fruit. It's big praying. It's praying that the kingdom of God and, the, and all the agenda of God take place as a result of your asking. That's fulfillment. But there's, a, there's another thing. Look at, again with me at verse 8. He says, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. I call that the glory of God that is revealed through much fruit in our life. I call that basking. You know, there's another, there's another word for sunbathing. It's called soaking up all the warmth and all the light from the sun for relaxation and pleasure. It's called basking in the sun. What he's saying in verse 8 is when your life becomes very fruitful, when it uh, bears much fruit, it brings maximum, maximum glory to your Abba, to your Father. And so you spiritually bask then in the warmth, in the light of the glory of God that is resting upon you. I'm telling you, that's fulfillment. Fulfillment that's lasting, fulfillment that in involves asking, and fulfillment that brings basking. But there is another aspect 
of spiritual fruitfulness in these verses. Look at verses 9 and 10 with me. He says, as the Father had loved me, so I have loved you. So continue. See the word continue? Same word translated abide. Abide in my love. Continue in my love. If you keep, verse 10, my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and I abide in his love. This is very clearly the fruit of the Spirit. The, the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's what he's talking about here. But let me let me translate it. Let me apply it in this way. I think the fruit of the Spirit that I just shared with you was fulfillment. I think the fruit of the Spirit here, which is really centered in love, is freedom. And here's what I mean by that. By abiding in him, we find freedom from our own selfishness so that we can love. You and I can never love as God intends us to love until we are set free from our own selfishness. Because naturally, we only love ourselves. Naturally, we don't love God and we don't love others as much as we love ourselves. And so what he's talking about here is that when you abide in the Lord, you will be set, you'll be liberated. You'll find freedom from selfishness so that you can love. You know, feeling loved by God creates a desire in the human heart then to obey God, to obey God's commands to love. In verse 9, I think the freedom here is really a perfecting. He says, remain, remain in this love. Remain in this love relationship with Jesus. And, and it will create a sense in your heart of being loved by God unconditionally. That is that nothing you can do will make you unloved by God. And when you come to that realization, it builds a feeling of absolute security that removes all your fears and all uh, uh, fear of rejection and judgment by God. Remember what he says? He says, perfect love casteth out all fear. It's a perfecting. And this has a transforming effect upon a person's life. When you sense God's love is unconditional, there is nothing that you can do to make him not love you. And that perfecting love of verse 9 becomes what he says in verse 10, a, a, a performing love. There's a perfecting freedom that brings a performing freedom where you, he says, keep my commandments. The realization of Jesus' love for you and his love in you flows then freely through you as you abide in him, as you depend upon him to love through you. It will enable you to fulfill this command to love anyone. Who do you have trouble loving? You can even love your enemies. You can be set free from such selfishness that you can love your enemies. Hey, you can even love your spouse. That's not always easy. The people that we live with, that we know most intimately, are sometimes the hardest people to love. But you can love your, your spouse. You can love the souls of men. You can love lost souls. You can love people. 
That's what Paul meant when he said this. It is the love of Christ which constrains me. It's the love of Christ that compels me. Why do I go to such lengths? Why do I suffer as I do? Why do I allow myself to endure such hardships? It's the love of Christ that drives me. It's the love of Christ that compels me. It's this freedom that sets you free from selfishness so that you can love God supremely and you can love others. That's the fruit. Fulfillment, freedom. There's a third one in verse 11. He says, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain. There's the word again, translated abide, that my joy might remain or abide in you and that your joy might be full. Here's the third fruit of the Spirit I want to talk about. Not only fulfillment and freedom, but here fullness, a fullness. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. And what's the next one? Joy. And that's the, that's the, the focus here. An overflowing joyfulness. You know why? Because you are confident that you are accepted in Jesus. You are unconditionally loved. And a tremendous joy swells within you so that you are able through the indwelling love of God, of Jesus, to express his love for you and in you to him and to everyone else around you. In fact, that's what Paul meant when he said, the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. It's there. Draw upon it. There is no greater joy in life than to experience and to live in a loving relationship with God. And when you live in a loving relationship with God, you know what? Then you have the ability to live in a loving relationship with others. That's the order. Feeling and knowing that in Christ there is absolutely no condemnation produces the uh, a fruit of great joy deep within your soul. Fullness. That's part of the much fruit. A fullness of joy. And then one final thing that I believe is spiritual fruit as well that we have here. Verse 13. Greater love hath no... I want you to note as I read these next few verses... How many times the word friend pops up? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Verse 14, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command, uh, whatsoever I command you. 15, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my father I have made known unto you. You've not chosen me. I've chosen you. Here's another part of the much fruit. I think it's friendship. Friendship. What he's telling us in that 16th verse is that God has chosen us. God has cho chosen us to be joined together with him as his eternal friend. We've been chosen to be the eternal friend of God. You ever get envious thinking about the fact that Abraham is called the friend of God? Well, I wish God would call me his friend. Well, guess what? He does. Not only that, we're his eternal friend. God owns us as his. God wants us to enjoy forever fellowship with him. He's friendly with us. God not only loves us, he likes us. We're his friend. We're friendly with God. We're on friendly terms with him. He calls us his friend. I want you to note some of the parts of friendship with God. In verse 13, friendship is sacrificial. See it there? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. 
the friendship that God's talking about, this fruit, this much fruit of friendship with God is sacrificial. It's a selfless giving of yourself for the benefit of God, for the will of God to be accomplished. It is to be personally willing to follow Jesus, whatever the cost is to you. Have you counted the cost to be a real, genuine follower of Jesus? For example, are you willing, if the Lord leads you to, to leave your job? Are you willing to leave your extended family? Are you willing to put yourself in harm's way in order to make disciples? Isn't this what discipleship really is about? If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, an instrument of execution, and follow me. It's sacrificial. This fruit of the Spirit, this much fruit of friendship is not only sacrificial, but in verse 14, it's deferential. Notice this. You're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. That is, it defers to Jesus. It's a humble submissiveness to satisfy God's desires and God's will. It's living not to please yourself, but the one you love. It's finding out what God loves, what pleases him, and making him happy, and, and, and jumping in with both feet, and completely investing yourself in your all. Well, if he died for all, then all no longer live unto themselves, Paul says, but unto him which died for them and rose again. It's deferential. It's a humble sub submissiveness to God, to his will. You know, I say this, and I mean it. <clears throat> I have two purposes in life. My first purpose is to make God happy. My second purpose is to make my wife happy. In that order. Really. That's my purpose in life. I live mainly to make God happy. And in order to do that, I got to find out what he wants. I got to find out what, what pleases him. I, I got to find out. I, I know generally what his will is, but what's his specific will for my life? This friendship is not only sacrificial and deferential, it's also confidential. Look at verse 15. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant doesn't know what his master, his Lord, does. But I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard of my father, I've, I've made them known to you. I don't have any secrets. I've taken you into confidence. That's what this friendship is about. This fruit is, you know, normally we're very careful, and I think rightly so, who we open our hearts up to, who we pour out our deepest feelings and desires to. We're very protective, and that's probably the right thing to do. We shouldn't just wear those feelings on our sleeves. Well, God established a very special, intimate revealing of his of the secrets of his heart to his friends, to you, to me. Question is, can God trust you to share with you the secrets of his heart? Do you have that kind of intimacy with Jesus? This kind of intimate fellowship with him? Part of the much fruit because as God shares his truth with you, you can believe him and you can trust him for miraculous answers to prayer. There's an interesting verse in Psalm 25, I think it's verse 14, that the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, them that love and trust him. He reveals his confidences to them, his secrets. It's a confidential friendship. You know, if you haven't figured it out by now, and I think you have, as human beings, we all want the same thing. 
We want to be autonomous. We want to have the say over our lives. And we want to be self-sufficient. We want to be independent and self-sufficient. But you know what? That's not how God created us. That's part of the sinful part of us. God created us as his imagers. And he did that for friendship. Uh, friendship with himself that translates that into partnership in which you're dependent upon God, not independent of him. And that's precisely what abiding is. It's dependence upon God, total dependence on him. And a dependent lifestyle will free you from loving yourself so that you can then find fulfillment and experience an overflowing joy. That's what I believe in the chapter is much fruit. It is fulfillment. It's freedom. It's fullness. And it is friendship. 